Good morning, everyone. My name is Simone Farresin, and together with my partner, Andrea Trimarchi, we are the founders of a design office based here in Milan and in Rotterdam called Forma Fantasma, and we are also the creators of Prada Frames. First of all, I can say that really welcome to the second editions of Prada Frames, titles, materials in flux. But for the people who are not familiar with Prada Frames, I would like to explain that this is a, a multidisciplinary symposium uh, conceived in close conversation with Mrs. Prada and Prada team that looks at the complex relationship between architecture, design, and the environment. The aim of this symposium is to bring together designers, architects, artists, creators, producers, but also scientists, anthropologists, activists, and legal and economic experts. The inclusion of voices beyond the discipline of design, it is not only a way to increase the depth of the research, but it is also an ethical position that respect the expertise, the knowledge of people and institutions in other fields. Before to expand further on this year's symposium, Materials in Flux, I would really like to thank Mrs. Prada, who trusted us in the process of development of Prada Frames, and also last year in this year's symposium. Materials in Flux um, was presented also already in Hong Kong at the Museum of Visual Culture M+. As it was for last year, we want to make use of the international dimension of the Salone Internazionale del Mobile di Milano and its role for the design community and beyond to offer a platform to critically look at the possibilities but also at the problematics of doing design today. In the first edition of Prada Frames, we look at a subject which is extremely dear to us. It was titled On Forest. We look at forests as a site of extraction but also as shelter for communities and as sentient entities the challenge our understanding of ecology and materiality. This year in conversation with Prada, we decided to focus on another subject which is really central to the culture of design and production, and it is waste. Since the development of industrial production and the subsequent increase of environmental damage, waste reduction and management have been placed at the center of the conversation of sustainability. Nevertheless, we feel it is important to address how waste reduction has also been a fundamental subject central to industrialization, but as a way to maximize profit. Because of this, the title of the symposium is Materials in Flux. We feel it is important to acknowledge that materiality is in a state of constant becoming. It is never static. How could it be obsolete? A piece of marble before to become a mineral reality, it was a complex variety of living creatures, as much as a piece of wood. It is the flesh of a plant. And even if with a different degree of complexity, the microphone, which is in this moment amplifying my voice, sooner or later it will be shred to make other things, and maybe let's see how that will develop, new sentient things. From this perspective, the notion of waste is rather reductive, closer to the way the economic market decides what has value and what has not. Instead, the ambition of materials in flux is to look at the potentiality of matter to always transform and become. The three days of symposium will at the moment look at extremely tangible questions, such as how a landfill is constructed, or the inventive practice of waste management and material applications, while other sessions expand the notion of waste to the unwanted or explore expansive ways of understanding the built environment. Before to start with the session, I would also like to thank the place we are in, Il Teatro dei Filodrammatici. Its history started already at the end of the 18th century, but the architecture that you see nowadays is the fruit of the work of a personal design hero, Luigi Caccia Dominioni. So in case you haven't noticed the wonderful stairs and mosaic floor, I invite you to do so in the foyer at the end of the morning session, because there will be no time for Q&A, but you can keep on the conversation between you all and the speakers in there. Let's start with Materials in Flux. Our first speaker is uh, Tim Ingold, and he's joining us online. Let's see. Okay. Tim, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you here at uh, Prada Frames. I'm going to read first an introduction and a biography, and then I will ask you some questions. Tim is a professor emeritus on social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen. He's carried out field work among Sami and Finnish people in Lapland, and has written on environment, technology, and social organization. 
on animals in human society and on human ecology and evolutionary theory. His more recent work explores environmental perception and skill practice. Tim's current interests line the interface between anthropology, archaeology, art, and architecture. Ingold is also a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Tim, it's really fantastic to have you. I think we cannot have had any other speaker opening a symposium titled Materials in Flux. Uh, you have been extensively writing about uh, the way makers also interact with, with materials. In this sense, the first question is uh, rather simple. I would like to know from you in which way materials are in constant transformations and in flux. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, well, let me start with the question of what would lead you to think of any piece of stuff as material rather than an object? Suppose I were to take just this thing here, this is a pot, and you'd say, okay, that's an object, and that's a pot. It happens to be made of clay, but it's a pot. Or this is a, a prehistoric stone tool, it happens to be make, made of stone, but it's a tool. But suppose I were to take up, this is, is a lot of wool, has still to be spun and, and woven into something, you say, that is definitely a material. So when we, when we ask it, what, what makes something a material, rather than an object, the answer is, well, it's something that we can do something with, that we can make something out of. So the very word material implies that it is, it is something that has not yet become what it is, it, but it has the possibility of becoming something, one thing, or another thing. So material is, in a sense, the potential to become. And you could also distinguish between matter and material in this way, that, that matter is uh, what it is, but material is what it does. So a chemist, for example, might describe water as matter, as H2O, and discuss its molecular composition. But we know from experience that water turns to steam when you heat it, makes a gurgling sound when it goes down the spout, and, and so on. I, it's, it's really interesting that this, this word, material, comes, of course, from the Latin uh, mater, meaning mother. It was originally applied by Roman carpenters for wood. And, and the very term gave this sense of, of giving birth as the, as the trunk of the tree gives birth to a branch that grows out from it. So the very, the very term, material, carries with it this connotation of, um, of, of birthing forth things into a world, of, of pr producing things, in the same way that the mother gives birth to the child. So, so when we work with materials, we follow them, we, we join in with the flux of matter, and that's a matter of, of entering into the grain of things, in entering into the grain of the becoming of the world and, and bending it to a purpose of our own, an evolving purpose of our own. So, so the becoming of things, that is the flux, tends to fall through the cracks of a world where all we see around us is solid object. This was something that Henri Bergson pointed out in his in his masterpiece, uh, Creative Evolution, where he said that we tend to imagine ourselves in among a word of, world of solids, of objective forms that have fallen out of the process of their creation. But if we want to understand how things come to be in the first place, then we need to enter into the grey, into, into the process of things becoming the objects uh, that they are. So that in in following materials and in answering them or answering to them, we, we, we kind of discover what they are. I mean, uh, how do we know that one a material is of this sort or of that sort? We know through, through listening to them, by doing things with them, and, and the, the materials then answer in their own way in terms of what, what they do. So, so that's, my, that's my answer. That, that's my sense that... that that materials exist as the potential to become things, but not as finished forms. Thank you, Tim. I mean, 
I think some of these subjects are, of course, uh, extremely relevant for the design culture. And you elaborated on some of these ideas also in your book, Correspondences, where you look at uh, how um, the intricate relations that weave together humans and other than humans to build the environment and the natural one. But I would like to focus on the term correspondence specifically and uh, substitute it to the term design. Because if we do so, then uh, you know, we as designers, architects, or makers, we are corresponding to materials. And in this way, I think what the word is doing is that we see ma ma materials not as passive, and then the author is somehow imposing uh, their own ideas on, on materiality, on matter. So in this sense, what do you think the term correspondence can help us to better understand the nuances in relation between matter and maker? And maybe can you also make some examples? Also in your book, you know, you really, what I love about it is that you also correspond not only with, with things, but also with, with forests, with trees, with, with disciplines. It is extremely expansive. Mm. Let, let me first make clear what I mean by correspondence, because it can be understood in different ways. Uh, for example, in mathematics or logic, uh, correspondence means matching one thing up to another thing, and that, that's not what I mean by it. I mean it in, in the rather more literal sense of, of going along with things and answering to them as you go. So, for example, in a conversation uh, that you're, you're, you're two people going along and answering to one another in a conversation are, are corresponding in that sense, or, or melodic lines in, in music or in a choir or in a quartet, going along together and responding to them as they go. So correspondence is an intrinsically temporal process of things becoming and, uh, and emerging in a continual dialogue with other things that are going along at the same time. And I, I wanted to introduce this idea of correspondence as part of an alternative to the so-called hylomorphic model of making things. In the, in the hylomorphic model, you have a, a passive lump of formless material, an active maker with a definite idea in mind of what he or she wants to make. And the making process is then a matter of imposing this design, this preconceived design, onto the material. So the maker is active and the material is passive. And that's a very domineering kind of approach. And I, I wanted instead to to think of making as a process in which the maker is, is inside the process. That, that there are all these things, all this stuff going along together in the world, and, and then in comes the maker as yet another participant in all of this, uh, inside the process, along with, with all the stuff and tackle of, of their trade, and, and, and moving along with and through the materials that, uh, that they work with. So, so corresponding with materials is not imposing form on matter, but bringing diverse materials together and combining or redirecting their flow in the anticipation of what might emerge. And just to give you some examples of, of, of this, um, you could think of, I've got three actually, you could think of cookery or gardening or painting. I mean, what, what would happen if we thought of the designer in the first place, not as an architect or, or an engineer, but as a cook or a gardener? And the thing about cooking is that um, you, in order to cook, you, you, you have to take the lids off things. You have to, to bring forth different kinds of materials. Uh, you mix them up, you stir them, you heat them, you cool them. And in that process, those materials um, uh, transform one another and, and or there's a metamorphosis that goes on that, that then produces uh, different materials in the process. So you, you, you start with, with butter, flour and sugar and milk and, and you put them together in the, in, in, in the pot and you stir and then you put them in the oven and you get a cake. So, so this is a, a process of material transformation that takes place through the correspondence and it, it's always a problem for the cook especially if you're a hopeless cook like me to, to keep any kind of control over what's going on so so these materials that you're working with they have their own proclivities their own tendencies the ways they want to go and it's all the cook can do to try and keep this thing under control 
and make the whole process go in the direction that they want it to. And, and it's much the same with gardening. If you imagine the gardener, they're, they're all these plants, they all have their own particular ways they want to grow and flourish. And, and if you just leave the garden, the garden to itself, it just becomes a jungle. So, so what the, the gardener is having to do is to try and desperately try and keep the thing going roughly in the way they want. And then just a third example of, of painting, the painter has all sorts of different pigments, which themselves in the past were created through a complicated alchemical process, and is mixing them up on the brush uh, and then and splaying them out again on the canvas uh, in the anticipation of what might emerge. Fantastic. Do you think this is challenging also the idea of what an author is, if matter somehow contributes to the process of making? Then, then, then you can't say that the maker, the maker is not really an author, right? I think that the maker is a kind of go-between, uh, somebody who's, who's negotiating a co complicated set of relations between a number of, of, uh, of uh, it's, it's a bit like, imagine, imagine every material is like a football player and you're a manager and you're trying to keep these players to work together somehow in order to produce a result. And, you, and you're, you're constantly engaged in the process of negotiation. Tim, I would like to ask you uh, just one last question related to uh, actually your field of research, which is anthropology. Because in 2018, you published a book which was all in praise of anthropology, was titled Anthropology, Why It Matters. And you know, we are opening the symposium with you. Last year, we had Anna Tsing. We're going to have Eduardo Cohn later in the morning. So we definitely believe that uh, you know, it is extremely important to involve anthropology in the, in the conversation around visual culture and, and design but also because I think, uh, um, you know, especially a lot of your writing also deals in ex really intelligent ways with the um, ecological crisis and the way we interact with the environment. So in this sense, I would like to hear from you why you think anthropology is so relevant for the century we are living in, but also what are the possibilities that anthropology put forward and maybe also what are the problematics or the limitations of conservative ways of thinking about anthropology? Okay, so let me just start with my, my definition of what anthropology is. And for me, uh, uh, anthropology is a, is a generous, comparative, open-ended, but nevertheless critical inquiry into the conditions and possibilities of life in the one world that we all inhabit. So that's what anthropology is, is about. Uh, and, and the key thing that anthropology does that I think no other discipline does is that rather than treating other people around the world as objects of its concerns, it actually works with them, it studies with them, in order to learn from all their experience. And, and, and my feeling is that, that in the current crisis, when the world is on a knife, we simply cannot afford to ignore a huge reservoir of know-how and wisdom and experience that lies with people from around the world. One could imagine every way of life is a kind of experiment in living. And, and we need to learn from all these experiments in living to find the answers to a question that concerns all of us on this planet, which it basically is, how should we live? I, I think anthropology is, 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 is an basically addressing that question. How should we live? And, and, and is trying to address that through learning and studying with people all around the world and learning from, uh, from uh, their experience. So, so that's definitely the assumption that the world we inhabit is indeed one world. It's not, it's not lots of different worlds. It's one world, but it's a world of never-ending and inexhaustible difference. It's a world of becoming that is continually continually ramifying along, uh, along it, it, its, uh, its many lines. And, and that's just where I feel there's also a problem, because there's a, there's a, there, there is a, a tendency to reduce anthropology to ethnography. That is to making, not to studying with people, but to making studies of them. And, and the result, and, and many people think that that's what anthropology does. It basically uh, it go, goes to, 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 to uh, make studies of different people around the world and contribute the knowledge of those peoples to the, to, to, um, to, to the debate. But 
But the, the trouble with that is that it, it takes away any voice that we anthropologists might have to speak for ourselves. And that, that, that it merely leaves us speaking for other people and, and representing these other people. When really I think our task should be to, to speak for ourselves to other disciplines to, uh, as part of the, the public debate about how to live, but to speak in a voice that has been educated by our studies with people around the world. And that's why I think that the purpose of anthropology in the first place should not be ethnographic, but educational. Educational in this fundamental sense of being led out into the world uh, and, and being educated by the things, the persons, the experiences that we find there. Fantastic. Tim, really thank you for opening the first session of uh, Prada Frames. We think your contribution is extremely valuable. We are looking forward to read more and more of your, of your books. And thank you again for being with us. OK. Well, thank you very much. Good luck with you. I will now leave the word to Andrea, who will present the next session. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea Trimarchi, and I'm the co-founder of Forma Fantasma. Welcome to the second session, actually the first session of Prada Frame, second edition in Milan. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Anna Guisola. Anna is an associate professor of classical archaeology and the director of collection of plaster cast and antiquities at the University of Pisa. Her principal research on greco roman visual material and literal culture has focused on architectural technology, urban development, the history and technique of ancient sculpture, the Greek and Latin literary sources on the figural arts, and the reception on classical arts in later period. Together with Salvatore Settis, she was the curator of Recycling Beauty at Prada Foundation in Milan. Welcome on stage, Anna. Thank you. According to the Roman official and intellectual Pliny the Elder, the author of the world's first encyclopedia, who died in 79 CE during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the white Pompeii of the map, a mosaic depicting what he calls an unswept floor was first created some two centuries earlier at Pergamon in today's Turkey, a city that the Romans gained control of after the middle of the second century BCE. It is a subject that must have enjoyed enormous popularity, as the many versions that have come down to us suggest. Chicken bones, nut and snail shells, breadcrumbs, fish bones and fruit scraps create a carpet of rubbish. The unswept floor was widespread both as an isolated subject and as part of larger images of the event that generated this much waste, a lavish banquet at which the diners had spared no expense. The unswept floor belongs to the same discourse about consumption articulated by the painting on the walls of many houses and villas, especially in Pompeii, Herculaneum, and other Vesuvian sites. There, the inhabitants were surrounded by nature's gifts, ready to be consumed. Still lives with meat, fish, and garden produce appear next to paintings with stacks of coins and writing instruments, the wax tablet and the stylus, alluding to the careful management required to enjoy so, much, so many delicacies and the income that they generated. Such keen interest in the material traces of consumption is not surprising in a society where the production and circulation of food and material goods had very different rhythms to those of the present. At the same time, in the ancient Roman world, the conquest of extensive territories, which by the end of the first century BCE encompassed the entire Mediterranean, swiftly increased the availability of resources and generated new economic dynamism driven both by the market and by the central political authority. Starting from this premises, I would like to explore the theme of the symposium, Materials in Flux, by focusing on the presence, function, and management of waste materials in, in pre-modern cities. 
What happened to the remains of the dinner once the pavement was swept? What information does the study of waste convey about the urban organization and the forms of economic life? I would first like to address the presence of waste in an ancient city, thus highlighting the fragility of morphological and functional identities in a society accustomed to the continuous reuse of materials. In the second part of my talk, I will try to show how this flow from one identity to another was regulated and how the modification and repurposing of materials, which is the hallmark of the ancient urban experience, was a process that posed major challenges. In order to make my argument easier to follow, I will focus on a specific time and place, the Mediterranean under the Roman Empire, and, and more specifically, although not exclusively, on a well-known case, which has provided an exceptional amount of written and archaeological documentation, namely Pompeii. Although it has been widely demonstrated that the town did not remain untouched after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and that both survivors, rescuers, and treasure hunters opened passages into the ruins, Pompeii's rapid destruction allows us to catch unparalleled glimpses into ancient life and the everyday dimension of the urban landscape. I will move across a wide range of materials, from food to bricks and marbles, reflecting the widespread nature of the phenomenon that we are discussing. At Pompeii, generic waste, both organic and inorganic, seems to have been widely used to regularize the soil and fill voids produced by the demolition of a building or by the excavation of deep pits in search of clay. In the context of an economy in which the sourcing and transporting of raw materials and the work of craftsmen were lengthy processes requiring significant financial outlay, Reuse depended primarily on logistical and economic factors. Even everyday, technologically simple objects survived in an array of new forms and functions. Large animal bones were useful for manufacturing a variety of tools, such as a stylus to write on a walked tablet, for instance. Discarded wooden items could be remade into smaller objects, or processed for charcoal, or simply burned. Once the animal had been removed, shells became valuable elements to decorate extravagant fountains. The cockle, in Latin cardium, provided a shellfish that could be eaten, and a round shell used to frame the squares filled with pumice or with shiny glass past mosaic. Purple dye for textiles was extracted from the murex snail. Its shells were arranged into rows at the top of the fountains, perhaps because of their shape resembling architectural moldings. The distribution of the fountains decorated with shells reveals a close relationship between the two spheres of consumption. At Pompeii, these fountains concentrate near taverns and workshops where fabrics were treated. However, this observation should not be loaded with excessive weight, since inns, laundries, and tanneries were obviously located in places well served by the city's water supply, where one would also expect to find more fountains. Amphorae, the most widely used containers for transporting and storing foodstuffs, were routinely used several times for different products and on very distant routes. According to a fascinating theory, the deposit of pot sheds that gradually formed an artificial hill known as Monte Testaccio on the left, left bank of the Tiber in Rome, the resting place of some 50 million amphorae, was linked precisely to the need to prevent the fraudulent reuse of containers that had been marked with inscriptions certifying their origin and capacity. And this was achieved by smashing them. In this case, the life of an object that could potentially last many decades or even centuries was purposefully interrupted. Such a choice obviously did not depend on the object itself, but on its content and on the exchanges in which it participated. 
broken into large fragments, amphorae could be incorporated into drainage systems or recycled in the preparatory layers of a floor or serve as a palette in a painter's workshop. Crushed into tiny flakes and mixed with lime, amphorae and other pottery vessels were used as a durable waterproof coating for built structures and floors. Old, unbroken tiles were placed on new roofs, while damaged ones provided covering for water and disposal ducts. Occasionally, it remains difficult to distinguish between requirements of a practical and economic nature and an appreciation for objects and materials of a certain value, as is the case with the reuse of finely carved marble tables as thresholds. The fragments of white or colored marble salvaged from the walls and floors of lavish buildings or discarded as production scraps were used for the colorful countertops of the taverns overlooking the streets of Pompeii and many other Roman cities. The choice and placement of the stone fragments indicate a gradation in fanciness between the surfacing surfaces facing the street and the ones facing the inside of the shop. The highest priority was given to the face of the counter visible from the outside. The difference implies that there were neither infinite quantities of these stones, nor was the supply free. In a house known today as the House of the Gilded Cupids, a shard of artificial black glass was set into the wall to imitate a mirror made of the far more precious obsidian considered to be an exotic material and one endowed with magical properties. There are, of course, many more examples that show the extent of reuse in the life of a Roman city, most notably the life cycle of sarcophagi, that is the stone or marble coffins in which the deceased were buried. During the Roman imperial age, the practice of assembling coffins using ancient reliefs or architectural slabs became widespread. And furthermore, the sarcophagi themselves were reused as building materials of various kinds, including toilet seats, when broken or damaged. Indeed, the practice of reusing not only sarcophagi, but entire funerary monuments is widely attested in the Roman world. Dozens of tombs in Hierapolis, in Phrygia, in modern day Turkey, perhaps the site with the highest concentration of Roman tombs, included inscriptions in which the owners specified the size of the tomb, its architectural shape, and the names of the family members who were allowed to be buried within, and the size of the fines inflicted on illegal occupiers. The inscriptions claiming ownership of the tomb and prohibiting others from using it follow each other in close succession, even just a few years apart, suggesting that the possibility of enforcing such prohibitions were very limited. This example brings us to the second part of my talk and to the question relating to how the practice of reuse was planned and disciplined, directly and regulating private initiatives. The case of Hierapolis and of many other cities in the Roman Empire shows that, at least at the local level, strict provisions were in force which regulated the occupation of a tomb. However, it is not clear who was in charge of enforcing them, nor how effective they were. What is clear is that goods or spaces perceived as abandoned were subject to intense competition. As is the case with tombs, it seems that the management of statues was also delegated to the local communities and to common sense in order not to run into disputes and legal consequences. Ancient authors mention the practice of reusing older honorary statues, broken and not standing on their pedestals. In all events, these sources explain reuse should be limited to statues bearing no inscriptions and thus free of an explicit connection to their former owner. Often, however, older inscriptions were erased to reflect a statue's new identity. In the case of the portrait of a man named Marcus Holconius Rufus, a magistrate and benefactor of the city of Pompeii, who had received many honors from his fellow citizens, viewers must have easily understood what the original subject of the figure was. The head, 
which is obviously too small in proportion to the body, and the remains of long hair on the back of the neck indicate that this is a reworked portrait, originally depicting a different person. The breastplate with elaborate reliefs suggests that this was once the statue of an emperor, probably a disgraced ruler like Caligula, whose image could be removed and transformed into the face and body of another man. If the reuse, legal or not, of statues, sarcophagi and tombs had an overall limited impact on the image of a city as a whole, the demand for building materials and architectural furnishings seems to have led to such problems as to require that the Senate and the Emperor intervene. With an estimate of close to 1 million inhabitants at the turn of the 1st century BCE and the 1st century CE, the city of Rome was the epicenter of unprecedented building speculation. Our sources tell of how buildings were sold to unscrupulous contractors who demolished them to extract building materials, thus aggravating the emergency of overpopulation and creating large quantities of rubble that were difficult to clear. A comparison of estimated manpower required for carving and salvaging marble veneer shows that making new panels of marble is roughly five times more time-consuming than sourcing second-hand ones, without taking into account the time and cost associated with transport over very long distances from the quarrying site. As early as 47 CE, the Senate of Rome issued a pronouncement aimed at countering in the city of Rome and in Italy, quote, this very violent form of speculation, end quote, associated with the demolition of buildings to recover materials for new construction sites. The bronze tablet on which this law is inscribed was found in Herculaneum and included a second pronouncement of the Senate issued around 10 years later in which permission was given indeed to complete the demolition of buildings that were already in ruins. This document is of key importance for the history of Pompeii, Herculaneum and the other cities around Mount Vesuvius. The eruption that raised these towns to the ground occurred in 79 CE but already a few years earlier, in 62 CE, the area had been hit by a major earthquake. Pompeii and Herculaneum both suffered major damage. Both cities were in ruins. The tablet inscribed with the rules issues, issued by the Senate may testify to the attempt by the local magistrates to clarify the matter and provide consistent instructions to a population in distress. It seems that round-the-clock recycling took place mostly in the peripheral areas around the city walls. On the day that Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE, massive waste deposits, you're now seeing the plan of Pompeii and the, and the yellow areas would be the areas occupied by waste, Massive waste deposits, which included building materials, discarded pottery and organic waste, stood outside the walls of Pompeii at various points. As early as the 1750s, Bourbon excavators recorded garbage piles around and beyond Porta Ercolano on the north uh, west corner. And at the end of the 19th century, more mounds of refuse were found outside all of the city gates and especially in the vast area around the amphitheater in the lower right side of your map, which is also the lowest in the entire settlement. The mound was highest near the city gates, with an average height of about one meter, thus reflecting how much waste even a relatively small population of about 10 to 15,000 could generate. On the one hand, the decision to concentrate waste in the areas outside the walls complies with some basic hygiene standards. On the other hand, to be commodified effectively, waste had to be gathered. Especially leftover waste and broken pottery could become valuable fill only in large quantities, well beyond what individual households or businesses could ever produce or store. 
As Alison Emerson, an American scholar from Tulane University, has argued in her landmark study of Roman peripheries, the area around Pompeii's wall made the ideal location for this gathering, sorting, and selling. Most of it was undeveloped public land. All the roads passing through the city gates were wide, in a good state of repair and suitable for vehicles, thus allowing for the easy movement in and out of the city. Unlike modern landfills, the afterlife of things, so the life of things after they had become garbage, was not confined to isolated locations, but was integrated into the normal functions of urban life as part of a cycle of production, consumption, and transformation. The reuse of building materials, in particular, must have required careful planning. The pieces that were intact or in good condition had to be cleaned of the mortar. For the broken or ruined ones, the damage and therefore the possible destination had to be estimated. Certainly, exploitation required accurate cataloging procedures, as attested by an important Greek papyrus from Oxyrhynchus that is in Upper Egypt, that provides an inventory of old columns specifying the size, material, state of preservation. Specialists in demolition and the supply of second-hand building materials certainly existed in the Roman world. We know of a guild of demolition experts called the Collegium Subrutorum, attested in the city of Rome. Cicero's comments on the public building project suggest that in the case of restorations, contractors would normally keep second-hand material that had to be replaced and could then sell it. At Pompeii, we have direct evidence for the sale of salvaged material. A painted sign along the city's main street advertised the sale of second-hand building materials. The inscription was located very close to two city gates, served by the only driveways in this district. The lettering of this sign, which has been erased by time and is no longer visible, that's why you're seeing a picture taken in the 1930s, um, indicates a late Republican date, that is the first century BCE. The text mentions the sale of roof tiles, gutter tiles, and drains taking place, quote, in the usual place, end quote. The word cumularia, which perhaps means accumulating in the very colloquial Latin of this text, may advertise the sale of large lots, or it may indicate the origin of the material gathered from old buildings. It is possible that the text refers to one of the dump sites located just outside the cities, those yellow areas that we saw in the earlier slide, a place that does not require more precise directions in an area where the main economic activity seems to have been the recycling of garbage of all kinds. As I was able to demonstrate thanks to several excavation campaigns in this part of Pompeii, the area around the amphitheater was very well served by the city's water network, thus creating an ideal environment for washing and scraping any salvaged items. Examination of the circumstances, sites, and technologies of reuse reveals century old craft traditions that remained virtually unchanged for a very long period, despite accelerations related to the history of each place. Whatever the reason behind it, from a technological point of view, reuse as an act of transformation is rooted in a material culture in which destruction and creation are parts of the same life cycle of objects. From the perspective of the formal quality of the new artifact, the recovery of older materials allows both upcycling and downcycling in equal measure. A broken vase may be shredded into very small pieces and mixed with mortar to create the lining of a sewer, but an empty shell may be included in the lavish decoration of a fountain. The reuse of waste and the recovery of objects was not merely a response to shortage of raw, of raw materials, but a complex production strategy. The case of Pompeii shows, on the one hand, the ubiquity of reuse 
in a pre-industrial city where every material, every building and every object was in flux. On the other hand, it shows how in urban societies this process did not happen, not even in ancient times, automatically as a form of spontaneous manipulation of things and matter, but was the result of careful strategies of cohabitation, exchange, and the many forms of recursive entanglement between human and non-human animals, plants, and things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna, for your fascinating contribution. Uh, we are very happy to host the next conversation between Ansu Ricobris and Eduardo Con. Sadly, Eduardo uh, got uh, a last minute health uh, limitation, so he was not able to join us uh, here, but he will join us remotely. Hans doesn't need a big introduction, but is an art curator, historian, critic, and the artistic director of Serpentine Gallery in London. Welcome on stage, Anne, and of course, you will introduce Eduardo for us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to Andrea, to Simone, to Ibrahim. I think we should all give them a big round of applause for bringing us all here together. <laughs> and of course, materials in flux was very much also the topic of uh, our wonderful collaboration at the Serpentine with Forma Fantasma, the Cambio project, which was an ever-evolving, ever-fluctuating and changing exhibition really focusing on samples, uh, actually, um, objects, artifacts, uh, uh, specifically designed furniture also made from a single tree felt during storms in Val de Fiemme, uh, wood samples loaned by many institutions. It was very much a re-evaluation of our relationship with trees and in a way brings us directly, of course, uh, to Eduardo Cohn, whom I'm so delighted to meet here for the first time. Please give Eduardo a very warm welcome. And um, we, before asking Eduardo a few questions, I wanted to just give a, a small introduction, linking it also, of course, to the importance of really decentering the human, something which is so um, fundamental in, in uh, Eduardo's work and something which I think is relevant in many artists, designers' practice in the 21st century. Of course, in Forma Fantasma, I was also thinking about Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg this morning, no, who at the Serpentine did for us a pollinator pathmaker, which is an extraordinary garden designed actually not for humans, but designed to uh, prioritize the needs of endangered pollinating insects. Um, uh, and th that's really the purpose of it. It's not to please humans, but it's to please pollinators. And all of that, uh, an evolving project, you know, assisted by, by AI. Or if I think also about Catharsis, a project by Jakob Knut Steensen, um, the uh, Danish artist and uh, technologist. It was a collaboration we had with BTS, um, um, extraordinary media project, but also a project in the park where the audiences were actually immersed in digital simulations of reimagined old growth forests. It had to do with Longue Durée, a forest that has, of course, you know, developed over centuries uh, and was based on fieldwork Steenson uh, had actually done with his primary collaborator, Matt Corkle, um, and the work's visual kind of ecosystem and synchronized audio comprised 3D textures and sounds scattered from lots of different you know, forests all over the world and was then transformed into a single continuous shot that moves from the watery underground routes to a surveying viewpoint of the, of the canopy. And all of that, of course, is deeply connected, Eduardo, uh, to your amazing work. Uh, Eduardo teaches anthropology at McGill University in Montreal. He's best known for the amazing book, How Forests Think. Uh, those of you who don't have it, it's an extremely urgent book to read in relation to the conference today, in relation to our time. And it's based on many years of research in the Ecuadorian Amazon and focuses on how the inhabitants actually of one of the world's most complex ecosystems relate to the forest's uh, myriad beings. Cohn is currently writing a book titled Forests for the Trees. We're gonna get an exciting insight today for the first time. It's almost like a world premiere. Eduardo is gonna tell us about this new book. And uh, 
it's an evolution from the first book. It focuses on how to find guidance, actually, from the living world that holds us. Uh, the world Amazonians call it forest in the context of an ecological crisis. But we're going to talk also, which I think is always so fascinating when we talk to thinkers and public intellectuals, um, about their take on the museum, on their take on you know, what a 21st century institution could be. And of course, many of you will know that Edouard Glissant wanted to build an all-world institute. Um, also, Françoise Vergès has an amazing project, actually, as an intellectual for an institution in uh, Guadeloupe. Uh, and we will today hear from Eduardo about his vision for what a 21st uh, century institution could be. That will be in context, of course, to a project which is so far still unrealized. And we will, in the context of that, then also have the opportunity to hear, at the very end of the talk, a sound sample, something to look very much forward to. Because, of course, if you think about what is urgent in our time, I had a conversation with the late Ete Latnan um, a few months before she passed away, age 97, last year. Uh, and Ethel was sort of saying, you know, the most important thing for her is that we learn to listen again. You know, the idea kind of of deep listening. And of course, that also connects deeply to one of the great composers of the uh, 20th century, Pauline Oliveros, with whom we did a project at the, at the Serpentine maybe, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and it was amazing to hear from Eduardo this collaboration also with music, with, uh, with composers deeply connected to Pauline Oliveros, so we'll hear about that at the end. But before beginning, another very warm welcome to the amazing Eduardo Kohn. Hi, Hans. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I just want to first off just apologize profusely for this. I was uh, had my bags packed, ready to go, but I had a terrible fall, um, and I have some serious injuries that have to be attended to. So. Um, I can't be here with, there with you in person, but I want to thank Ibrahim and Hans especially for your flexibility and for you, for the to the audience for for allowing me to be here uh, with you virtually. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Eduardo. And I wanted to um, begin actually by asking you uh, to tell us about because we have images in the background. We're going to have them in a sort of a rotating way. Um, and I wanted to ask you to tell us about this idea of decentering the human, which is really uh, very much the core of how forests think. And I wanted to ask you also how this all began, because actually you were already for many years engaged with the Quechua speaking Runa, who live in Ecuador's upper Amazon, before you did the book. So it would be great to hear a little bit how this dialogue began, how you first learned about them, your impressions and experience of also living with uh, these communities, and how then, you know, early articles like Runa Realism, Upper Amazonian Attitudes to Nature Knowing, and how Dark's Dream, Amazonian Natures and the Politics of Trans-Species Engagement, led, in a way, to your amazing book. Thank you for, the, for, that, um, for that entry. Um, I, in many ways, began the, uh, my research into, into what became How Forests Think by doing what anthropologists normally do, which is ethnography, which is a form of hanging out. Uh, you could say it's a form of deep listening. Um, and as with Paulina Oliveros, who asks one to listen to all sounds available, the sounds that are inside oneself, those sounds made by people, those sounds made by the built environment, those sounds made by the non-human world. Um, it's a, in a sense, that's what anthropology is. It's a form of radically deshackling the human, opening up our, releasing the constraints we normally have, and trying to listen in new ways. Doing so in a place like the Amazon, filled with so many kinds of beings, and in the company of humans who are attuned to all those kinds of beings, made it the kind of anthropology I did quite different. Not methodologically, because at that stage, what I was doing was simply hanging out. But what I heard changed my thinking of what it means to be human, because I realized that people were uh, attuning themselves, communicating with many other kinds of beings. And the forms that those con conversations took changed what I understood communication to be. 
I wanted to ask you also to tell us about this shared perspective, because um, in, in a way, in how far things humans and non-humans share perspectives, and also how actually the forests think in images, because images play a very important role in, in your work. Those are great, great, um, great, great questions. Um, in terms of shared perspectives, you'll see in, in the looping slides, there'll be one, one image of um, a woman and a boy and a dog. Very simple, everyday image. Um, you see it all the time. What grabs me about that image is that all of those beings, a child, an adult, and a canine, are all sharing a point of view. They're all, their attention is drawn to the same thing. For a moment, they're reacting as one. And for me, that was a very important insight that despite the kinds of differences we might have, the skin bound differences, the species differences, at times we can actually share something. And that was a very important insight for me. And can you talk a little bit about how it then sort of connects to psychedelic science? Because you, you sent me a, an advanced chapter of uh, your new book, which is unpublished. It's uh, called Psychedelic Science. Uh, and in that chapter you state, here is a quote um, from you, I have long aimed to release my discipline from what is sometimes called the prison house of language. And at the end of your previous book, actually, How Far Are Things, you already state that this book is about actually learning to think with images. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and about how to kind of go beyond this, what you call a, a prison house of language in your writing? And the role yes. psychedelics play for that. Yes, thank you. So um, we tend to, you know, humans have a very special way of thinking, which is through language, or through in technically technical terms, through symbols. And symbols have a very specific property. Um, they, uh, in order for a symbol to refer to something, something like a word, it must refer first to other kinds of symbols around it. This creates a system that in some sense has a separation from the world. It's part of who we are and uh, we would be silly and foolish to think that we could get rid of it. But what's important to recognize is that that system is actually nested into a much larger field of thought, uh, the kind of thought expressed by forests and the beings that live there. And that kind of thought has um, its main property is its imagistic logic. So in the slides you saw, here is an interesting slide, the man, uh, watching that the man, uh, a woman learning how to use a gun and a man smiling and using his, putting his hands like this. He is in a sense, in, and here's another man um, unconsciously imitating the form of Christ. Um, all of these are forms of imagistic thought. They, they sometimes happen below the register of language and they're forms of identification with the world and they have a certain kind of power. Um, that's that kind of thinking structures a world like of the world of forest, the world in which we all live. We all live in a forest. And that kind of thinking um, is the kind of thinking we need to tap into as we as we fall, learn to fall back into the larger form that holds us. The book I wrote, How Forests Think, is a book that comes out of deep immersion in, in living with Amazonians, also living with shamans. Um, and one of the things I did not do in those 25 years of research that involved writing that book um, is I never took psychedelic drugs for a bunch of reasons. I happened to live with a shaman who was quite shy and quite traditional and wasn't really interested in sharing that with me, which is all very good. My current work is with um, the Sapara Nation uh, who consider themselves the emissaries of the forest and uh, and I work specifically with an Amazonian shaman, Manadi Ushiwa, pictured here. Um, and he is quite more experimental in his own methods. Um, and he asked me to help them, his community, write, use writing as a method to transmit the thoughts of the forest to the larger world. And psychedelics proper were, was part of that method, taking uh, the psychedelic ayahuasca. When I took that, many, many things happened, including um, uh, the idea for the creation of the, this museum, which we can talk about later. But one of the things I realized is that when I was talking about a forest as a thinking forest, 
I was also talking about it as a as a psychedelic one. I I, I like the word psychedelic uh, in its Greek uh, etymology, the manifest mind, and I see a forest as a collection of so many small minds, selves, thinking entities that collectively um, manifest something larger, a larger mind. And I see this as that form that moment of of the creation of the of the emergence of something larger as the quintessence of what <clears throat> what life is um and <clears throat> i see as our ethical goal to both uh create curate spaces where that can happen <clears throat> and to recognize it in ourselves to recognize excuse me the psych <clears throat> the psychedelic all around us <clears throat> not by taking drugs um of course, that's a tool, but it's also a, it's, it's also a symptom that somehow we're missing this. Um, so psychedelic for me is, is a way to talk about um, an ontological fact of the, of the living world on the one hand. It's also a way to talk about the um, a form of cultivating uh, a way of being that, rec that can recognize not just all the, the small sentences around us, <clears throat> but the emergence of something larger, something more general, something you could call spirit. And I think that that need to sort of understand these larger invisible entities is something very, very much needed in these times. I mean, we've just lived through and we're living through a whole series of crises that are characterized by their generality. I think about the COVID pandemic how to understand that the actions that individuals had to take in order to think about a larger collective good and the difficulty to do that, things like masking. Um, and we can think about the climate crisis, something that is both everywhere and nowhere. Um, all of these are problems that are general. And what a psychedelic science helps us see is that things like generalities actually come to be in the world around us and require certain forms of attunement that Amazonians um, cultivate, often through their ability to think with images in a very specific way, using visions and dreams. Thank you. Now, it's interesting that in the text, uh, chapter two, actually, of the book, A Psychedelic Science, you raise this question, when and where does a psychedelic trip begin? And when and where does it end, right? It's a big question. The question is trickier, you say, than it looks. It's not only words and substances that are psychedelic, nor only the rituals they animate. The world itself is psychedelic, a symphony with roots and branches, a song with beginnings and ends, none of them definitive. Can you tell us more about the world itself being psychedelic? Yes, I mean, we, we can think of... Um, the world of life, the world Amazonians call forest, um, as, 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 as the world we live in, the world that holds us. And the idea that I, uh, I try to, um, that I, my idea is that, well, I mean, it also can be captured in the, in the working title of this book. I'm not sure I'll hold on to the book. It's a bit too clunk, uh, we'll hold on to this title, but for now, it's appropriate. Um, the title of the book, Forest for the Trees. Of course, we all know the, um, the English saying, you've missed the forest for the trees. We usually think of that as a, as a way of saying you're unable to abstract from particulars. It's a particular failure in human cognition, humans being those who are able to make abstractions. My claim here is that there, something like an abstract, abstractions actually exist in the world. That is, when you go out to the Amazon, on the one hand, there's a particular reality of trees, but there's a, there's a more profound reality, which is that of the forest. And that abstraction is not my own. It's one that's continually made by life. Life is continuously making abstra abstractions. Now, one of the images you're seeing floating around on looping through the uh, slides is one of what looks like leaf litter, um, kind of brown leaf litter. 
If you look carefully, you'll see an insect there, a mantid. It's called the Amazonian leaf mantid, dead leaf mantid. That mantid has come over evolutionary time to look like the leaves around it. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that now in the, in the forest, that one, the image you can see right there, now in the forest, you'll see there, there are leaves that are leafy, of course, but so too are some insects. And in some sense, leafiness has become a general property of the world. It has become manifest. Those kinds of generalities are real, and we need to, we need to learn to traffic in them and to work with them. And that, in fact, is what Amazonians do. My, my companion, my collaborator, my oddkin brother, uh, Manari Ushigwa, continues, con, con, emphasizes that the reality of the world is not the material dimension, it's the spiritual dimension. And that's what he's getting at. The sense in which these forms of generalities have a reality and they have causal effects. And we need to learn to tap into them. Learning to tap into them requires a kind of ascent in thought to, to traffic in generalities. And that form of ascent is psychedelic. It requires a breakdown of our previous sense of self such that a larger, higher order self can emerge. The psychedelic process is both the disruption of the self that holds us, the vessel that holds us. I, the, the term ayahuasca both means soul vine and vine of the dead. Um, it requires a death of that kind of a self so that a larger, more encompassing self can emerge. One that is not just made out of the person we thought we were, but is made by the merger of many other kinds of entities uh, that make us. Thank you for this great answer. Now, before we talk about your museum idea, your unrealized project, and then also the sound work related to Pauline Oliveros, I had one more question about this new book. Why Me, Why Now is another title you use or subtitle. And it's an experiment in writing also, which is interesting. It's uh, a memoir, it's a manifesto, it's a speculative essay, it's an attempt to register in language forms of life, thought, community and politics that are in fact inseparable. So these things are all entangled and as you already explained, it goes beyond language. I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the format of the book. And I also thought it was interesting that it actually grew out of a, of a text you did for the 2019 Chicago Architecture Biennial, which already had the title Forest for, for the Trees. And I think it's interesting because we were listening earlier today um, to Tim Ingold, and uh, uh, he gave a wonderful speech here um, about this idea of material in, in flux. And of course, Tim Ingold for so many years has been uh, a toolbox, right, for for visual artists. I always remember already something like 10, 15 years ago, Pierre Wieg always said, you know, you must read Tim Ingold. And uh, of course we heard from Pharma Phantasma, to which extent um, your work or Tim Ingold's work, you know, is a kind of a toolbox for them as designers. And I see very often your book and Tim Ingold's book, for example, in, in studios of artists. So this idea of it being a toolbox, actually, for very practical use seems, seems also interesting. And of course, interesting, that it's an architecture biennial, which in a way, you know, commissioned you to do this text. So it would be great to hear a little bit more about that and about the format of the book, and then we can segue into the museum. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, why me, why now? Um, one of the things that I, in, I insist on is, uh, is that the psych, and this is something I've, I've learned from my Amazonian companions, um, is that the dissolution of the self is not about just sort of merging into the world. It's about holding on to some sense of a self. It is about using oneself as a vehicle for expanding oneself. One of the things, when, when, when I first went into the Amazon with Manadi um, to, uh, to write about the world called forest, to transmit the Sapada notion of what the forest has to tell us, to use writing to do that, um, to be that kind of conduit. The first thing that Manadi told me before we took ayahuasca was, um, you know, he said, look, obviously in some ways you're here to listen to the forest, but you can't just start there. 
you have to ask yourself, who are you? Who, you have to ask yourself, who am I? And how is that I part of a larger we? A we that includes the sapadas and the forest. Um, so my journey into that larger we of necessity requires a journey back into myself and a, a, a relationships to my family, to my grandmother, who you see pictured there, who was an amateur archaeologist. Um, those things became extremely important and they continue to be. And so in some sense, without being self-absorbed, I, I need to attend to the vessel that is me in order to understand uh, what I could be and what we can be. Um, and if that's not just about me. We all have to do, do, I think we all have to do things that way. Um, so, and this has a very important design and ecological feature. For, for people like Manari, um, the way to understand our step forward is to understand the configuration we are part of. Um, the way Amazonians uh, have developed a whole kind of form of ethical wayfaring that does this, that involves dreams. When, when, when you dream and, you know, when you reflect on a problem you have, an ethical problem, should I do this, should I do that? The ways in which Amazonians arrive at conclusions is by falling back into the world of dreams in which one sees the larger configuration of which one is part. Um, and then when, upon waking, one can take that configuration, literally a kind of a shape, a design, a form, and then see the various elements of one's life, current and future and possible, as part of that form. And then one can do the work to recreate that form. Um, so there's a really important and interesting design feature there. It, it requires on the one hand, the ability to fall back into self-organization. On the other hand, it requires the work to actually create that form, the political work, uh, the, the, the willful work. Um, but that, that form is in some sense virtual and it is held by the past, one's past. Now, in terms of the practical aspect, you know, how to transform it into practice, we, you know, I mentioned Cambio or Forma Fantasma, which explored the ways in which trees have been conceptualized by different disciplines, you know, and there were very practical manifestations of environmental awareness in that show, in relation to science, to conservation, to, you know, engineering, policy making. And this is something which is important in your work. I mean, a recent article you wrote is called the fight to secure rights for rainforests, and uh, it's actually, you're quoted in that article, yeah, uh, uh, we have to put things in terms that judges can understand. At the same time, we want to change how they understand things. So, so that's interesting. I mean, that's something Bernard Stiegler always said. I mean, how can we actually bring theory very concretely into a political decision process? How can we produce reality, right? And if you think about how to put theory into practice, um, that's, of course, also the segue in, into your museum. Eduard Glissant always told me, you know, he wanted to produce reality beyond his books. He wanted to start a school, which he did in Martinique. He wanted to start um, his All World Institute. He wanted to build a museum, you know, for the 21st century. Um, and you've been telling uh, me over the last couple of days when we spoke and when we Zoomed about similar ideas in terms of actually putting your theory into practice. So yeah, I want to hear more about that and about and also in general also how to put Sylvian thinking, uh, as you call it, and how to put psychedelic thinking into practice so as to kind of imagine new ways of, of living in a world. Thank you. These are really important uh, points. Um, I see uh, the work of an anthropologist. Um, I, I see an anthropologist uh, very much like a shaman. Sometimes I think of anthropologists as uh, what my uh, colleagues Isabel Stengers and Eduardo Vieira de Castro's call cosmic, di a cosmic diplomat. Um, my goal as an anthropologist is to move between worlds. Uh, in my case, the world of, of the forest, the world of shamans, the world of science. Um, and to find a way that they can uh, come together. Now, there's 
very important tensions um, between those worlds, and I don't mean to minimize them. In fact, I find the tensions incredibly productive. I, I think of, as I mentioned earlier, I think of my relationship with Manadi Ushiwa as one of odd kin. Um, we are, as he says, medicine for each other. Medicine in the Amazon is both a, uh, is like the pharmacon, a toxin and a remedy. And that difference and that alliance is what's productive in creating a new form of thought. Um, so I'm trying to be a cosmic diplomat in the sense that I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to negotiate among worlds and make those worlds palpable and and experientiable, exper exper able to be experienced by others. The book that I'm writing um, is not an academic book, although I hope to be advancing new ideas that are are interest for people who um, for specialized for specialized audience. But it's also a popular book um, coming out with, with trade presses. And the idea there is to use writing as a form of allowing someone to feel these things. So for example, in that chapter of psychedelic science, my aim, and hopefully I can pull it off, is not just to talk about psychedelics, but it is to actually make the act of reading a process of psychedelic mind manifestation. Um, and it's the same with, um, with the museum I'm creating, uh, with a team of architects, with Manadi Ushigwa, with uh, sound artists. The idea in this museum, uh, the, the, basically the, the museum, uh, the backstory of this museum is that um, my grandmother was an amateur archaeologist. She had a series of art, lived in Ecuador, had um, a collection of archaeological artifacts or figures, um, mainly shamanic from the coast of Ecuador. Um, and when she died, she wanted this, uh, this collection donated to a museum, which I, which, which I made happen. And I thought I'd wash my hands of this situation. Um, then the images you see right there, um, in the slide, uh, when I took, um, ayahuasca that first time with Manadi, um, in came flying my grandmother, uh, on top of a flying Jaguar, just like that image, um, and uh, just like uh, Dr. Strangelove atop the bomb, a sort of trickster. And I realized that that too was, I had to tell the story of the forest through that venue as well. So I've been creating, uh, uh, designing, and I hope it will really happen. It's, it's, on, it's on its way, um, a, a museum in Ecuador. There's, the, there's some images of the, uh, of the, of the renders of, of our, the design. A museum that will help curate a space where, um, again, the, the visitor can experience the animate life of the forest, uh, not just as an object or a theory of some belief, but actually as a presence. Um, and we do through this through a number of, of design uh, techniques. Um, and, and we also do this, uh, well, uh, by, this is another image that's very important. It's a, a vessel of a, of a a vessel of a jaguar, or a vessel, ceramic vessel, that has the skin of a jaguar on top. And I think of a vessel, here's another Amazonian, this is a contemporary Amazonian vessel, as a very important kind of tool, and very much speaks to many of the things I'm interested in. You see, in, on the one hand, there's a materiality to this, right? And there's a tremendous art to creating this. But on the other hand, what this is, is the product of what it's not. It's this absential space that this holds. The idea of a vessel is all about this. This is not the real thing. The real thing is what's not here, right? The museum is like that. It's a, it's a, it's a vessel for creating um, the possibility of having a contact with this other thing. The animism, the spirit life of the forest. Now, we live in a time, in a very convoluted time. We live in a kind of anachronism. We've, we are, we've pulled up uh, the fossil remains of, pro of previous life and are burning them uh, to create our forms of life in ways that have, um, will have effects for, for thousands of years to come. Um, this museum uh, deals with another kind of anachronism. These, uh, Ceramic figures were pulled up from, from the ground, uh, you know, in ways that have, there's ethically questionable. 
Uh, they're now reinserted into another kind of life, into a museum. Um, and we've done another, and, and we've, we've taken that and gone further. We took um, ceramic flutes from the, from this, from the, what was the coat, the rainforest of the coast, thousand year old flutes. And we got special permission to take them to the Amazon, to another forest and to play them again there. Um, and to reinsert uh, that kind of life again into the kind of life from which it emerged. That form of anachronism by mapping it on to the anachronism uh, that produced the climate crisis is one way to, to think about and to respond to the problems of our times. Thank you so much. I really hope that this unrealized project, you know, will, will be realized. And I suppose we could end maybe on, because we've got here Pauline Oliveros, uh, the Carnegie Hall uh, in 2023, on the occasion of her 90th um, anniversary. And I suppose the museum will also have to do with a deep listening experience. And I think it's interesting, um, I mean, I told you about Farmer Fantasmas Cambio, and that had to do with, you know, listening to, to trees. Um, you have Tim Ingold, who wrote in the Correspondences book, wonderful letters also to non-humans. There are great letters Tim Ingold wrote to, to trees. Um, and if you think about, you know, listening in design, it's also interesting that this becomes more and more an urgent topic in architecture, right? Rather than imposing buildings to a specific context, it's about you know, deep listening. We see this every year with our pavilion, you know, working with the Serpentine Pavilion with a younger generation of architects over the last years. We more and more see how these pavilions have to do with listening. We're working now with Lina Gottme, who excavates and learns from the traces of the past and listens to the voices of the ancestors. So the pavilion of Lina will be a listening device, right, to, to the voices of the, of the ancestors. And Eduardo, our wonderful, uh, actually, uh, Zoom the other day made me revisit uh, my conversations with Pauline Oliveros from 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I wanted to quote here from it um, to kind of remember her important contribution, because I asked her how she had this epiphany for, for deep listening. And she told me that she tied to the first tape recorder, quote, because I got that in 1953, when tape recorders first became available to consumers, and the first thing I did was put the microphone in the window and record whatever was happening. I realized when I listened to the tape that there were sounds on there I hadn't been conscious of as I was making the recordings. So from that moment onwards, I told myself to listen to everything all the time and keep expanding my awareness of sounds around me anytime, anywhere. That was my meditation, if you will, and from there it grew. In 1988, we made the recording in a system and the CD that was recorded was called Deep Listening. And that led to a band called the Deep Listening Band. So it was about the practice of a way of listening and responding. And as Pauline said further in the interview, a few pages down, if you are not listening, you're not going to be aware. And that, of course, was a huge inspiration for John Cage, right? Pauline Oliveros was an amazing inspiration for John Cage. And John Cage said in 1989, through Pauline Oliveros and deep listening, I finally know what harmony is about. It's the pleasure of making music. And Pauline Oliveros answer to that, to Cage, that harmony is perceiving relationships through listening. That's what I think harmony is. I'm interested in the central nature of sound and its ability to transform and change. So it's you know not only changing materials, but also changing sound. So I wanted to ask you to tell us about your relationship to Pauline Oliveros and also contemporary composers working today who work with you know, the legacy of Pauline Oliveros. And then maybe at the end of your answer, as a great finale of uh, this talk, uh, play us the, uh, the sound piece you, you specially brought for the talk today. Thank you so much. Yes, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm blessed. I've been having... Um, some of the most fascinating in over the last few years, my work has become really truly collaborative. And um, the, 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 the collaboration with musicians uh, happened in a, in a strange way. Um, I got an email from a friend in New York 
about um, a, uh, a how forests think uh, performance, ensemble performance at Lincoln Center, and I knew nothing about it. Um, and it turns out that the uh, great experimental composer, Lisa Lin, had been inspired by my book to, to create a, a, an ensemble piece called How Forests Think. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, that, that fact sparked a, a, a collaboration. Um, I, about a year later, I went to Banff uh, with Lisa Lim, uh, Claire, invited by Claire Chase, the flutist Claire Chase, uh, with a whole bunch of um, uh, musicians from the International Co uh, Contemporary Ensemble, ICE. Um, and from there, we've been, began to work also with Manadi. Um, I played them a, an earlier version of the soundscape we'll, we'll hear, and 50 musicians came together and, and created an answering soundscape to send back to the Amazon. Um, when COVID hit, um, Claire invited me um, and the Sapadas and Manari to be part of a Zoom uh, project run by Julie Bouvet and Sonic Matter to, uh, to perform the witness score in many parts of the world. This is a score, an op a text score created by uh, Paulino Oliveros, which has three strategies, which are fascinating. Uh, it, it, the Pauline asks us to first pay attention to oneself to make a sound unlike any other sound around us and any other sound one has ever made. This is an impossibility. It requires a complete dissolution of the self. Um, and from there to engage in a practice of listening um, to attend to others this is a strategy two, attending to others. Um, and as one does so, one is asked to actually understand the past and the future of the listeners of the, of, of, of the performance. Um, and that impels us to gain leadership, as she says, to become a witness, to see the larger whole of which we're a part and to bring and guide others to that. Um, and that culminates in strategy three, attention all over, where we all in some, some, through some sort of telepathy can be part of this whole. And this has become a, a very interesting exercise in that we've, we during uh, during the COVID with my colleague pictured here, Fabiano Cueva, the Ecuadorian sound artist, we in, involved the Sapara youth in a, a project. And by Zoom, we had a witness a session between the Amazon and Claire Chase's uh, studio in upstate New York and myself in Montreal. And then just now in January, uh, there was a performance of the witness at Carnegie Hall, uh, in which uh, Manadi Ushigwa was on stage as a witness to the witness. Um, and much of the rehearsal involved Manadi telling the musicians what was happening from the point of view of the spirit world. Um, so this is uh, of a piece with something I've come to be called to call vital song. I see, the, I hear, the, I think of the shamanic chant, the calls of insects, the efforts of musicians um, as, as ways to tap into this larger living story without words that we're part of. And I see that our goal is to become a witness to this, to gain leadership, to see, to help see where we may be going and to take us there. Um, I think that's what true anthropology is. I think that's what true leadership is. Um, and the soundscape you'll hear is is part of this. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, based on field recordings that Manadi, Fabiano, and I made with the flutes from the Amazon. It has a shamanic chant, uh, and it was edited shamanically uh, as a process, uh, a form of allowing you to you, the listener, to become a witness. Um, so, with that, I think we can listen to part of it. Great, let's listen.
Eduardo, thank you so, so much. Another big round of applause for Eduardo Kahn. Thank you. Well, and of course, a big round of applause on Zurich. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, thank you all of you for coming today. And uh, I mean, if you have any question to any of our speakers, we will be at the foyer having some drinks. So you are more than welcome to join. And all the lecture of today will be available from tomorrow morning at prada.com. And see you today at the second session of the day at 3 p.m. Thank you.